Our last speaker before our lunch break is Derek Churchill. He is a forester and a scientist at the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences at the University of Washington. And he's here today to talk to us about restoring pattern, structure, and function in dry forests. Um, what I'm talking about today is, is our rest, kind of more stand level restoration approaches. Uh, a lot of different methods we've been working on in, in Region 6, um, Oregon and Washington and, and parts of California. Um, so before I start, I just want to make clear this talk is, is mainly focused on, on dry forest, on, on our more frequent fire uh, and, and some mixed severity forest, our ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, western larch forest, and again at the, that low and mixed severity end, end of the spectrum. This isn't uh, really about lodgepole pine or, or doesn't relate to, to those high severity systems. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, first of all, um, you know, this, this idea of, 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 of this, these mosaic, clumpy, gappy patterns that are characteristic of, of frequent fire forests. And when I say frequent fire, I mean you know, every five to 20 years, may, maybe 30 years or so. Um, so these systems that historically had these very active fire regimes and, and evolved um, with that fire and their stand, stand dynamics and forest development is really tuned to that. Um, so I'm going to go through some background and rationale for, for why it's, we think it's important to, to pay attention to this pattern in our, in our restoration treatments. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some ways to quantify uh, and, and, and um, design treatments around uh, restoring these patterns. And then I'm going to end with some uh, monitoring results of what kinds of treatment approaches uh, work and, and don't work uh, in terms of, of restoring the, these patterns. So I'll just start by saying I think it's been pretty well established in forest ecology and management that when we think about uh, restoring resilience, this sort of catch-all phrase that we use now, uh, and ecosystem services, these kind of array of things that we're managing for, um, and we want to do this at a large scale, uh, that this idea of heterogeneity variability is important. It's an important part of, of the way these ecosystems function. Um, and, and we need to think about that at, at a variety of spatial scales. And by that I mean we start down here, uh, you know, at, at within, within stands, tree neighborhoods, clumps, openings, dense patches. Those are parts of stands here. These are parts of kind of hill slopes or small watersheds, catchments. And these are part of large, large landscapes. So we're thinking about uh, the structure and composition and, and how they're arranged, the pattern, at, at these multiple scales. Today, my talk is really focused on this, this stand level here and, and these elements that make up stands here. So, but I, I want to make sure that you know, we always need to remember that these stands are what, what make up our landscape restoration. So we're thinking about our stands in that context, and um, you know, that's a, a topic for another, another lecture. But I, before I drill down into stands, I want to make sure that that landscape piece is, is there. So we've been doing stand level restoration for, for quite a while now. Uh, fuel reduction treatments. Um, we've, you know, by and large figured out how to do it. Um, there's been a ton of science, uh, lots of uh, management guidelines and research and monitoring and whatnot. Um, you know, we have these forests. Sometimes we have a nice backbone of old trees. Sometimes we, we cut them all down, but we have this ingrowth of dense, uh, typically shade, more shade tolerant trees. And we go in and remove that. Um, we have these principles, you know, retain, release the larger and the older trees. Uh, we want those fire resistant species. Uh, we're we're uh, removing the shade intolerant, uh, less fire tolerant species. We're again thinning from below, reducing those ladder fuels. We need to treat the surface fuels. Again, these are common things that are, that are very well established. I would argue that it's only been more recently in the last 10 to 15 years that we've been paying more attention to this idea of, of the need to, to restore a mosaic spatial pattern as part of our treatments. So again, this is a more, I'd say, version 1.0 uh, fuel treatment um, that, uh, that you still see uh, you know, out there, but I think particularly on Forest Service land is, is certainly less common today. And now we're moving more to these kinds of treatments uh, with this array of, of openings and clumps and, and uh, again, these, these much more variable mosaics. Um, Again, these aren't intrinsically bad. I don't want to come across saying that you know, we've destroyed the forest here, 
but uh, the idea is that uh, we're, we're reducing fire behavior, we're getting some of the functions from this, but with this we get, we get more of the functions that we want to restore. That's the argument anyway. So when we, when we look at these, these frequent fire forests with active fire regimes, and we look at all across the world where you have frequent fire, uh, you, you see these, this structure and pattern, these low density, really open forests, 20, 30% canopy cover, maybe 40, um, dominated by large and old trees, fire resistant species, and this pattern of individual trees, clumps of a range of sizes, small clumps to large clumps, and then openings, these networks of, of, of openings, linear, sinuous kind of uh, gappy openings. And then we have regen thickets and hardwood patches and riparian areas and, and so forth, um, and pretty small patch sizes. Again, these are fine scale mosaics, and definitely multi-age, um, as we'll talk about. We have a whole variety of ages. And another thing that's interesting and later is, you know, we see a lot where you have these gradients. You have some parts of places that are much more open, still a lot of that fine scale clumpy gappiness in here, and then you move over and now it's denser over here. Uh, this might be topography or soil driven or past disturbance. Uh, you still have a clumpy gappy pattern here, but the density is higher. And so again, there's I think two levels of variability we're talking about, this fine clumpy gappy individual tree, and then more of that, that tree neighborhood or patch level variability. So, before I get too far into pattern, and I, and I love to geek out about pattern, uh, I always want to come back to why does this matter, right? As, as you know, sort of ecological foresters or silviculturists, we can get really into the, the weeds of it, but, you know, pattern or heterogeneity variability, that's not the goal, right? That's not, heterogeneity is not an end in, in, of itself. We're managing for functions, right? For habitat, for fire behavior, for uh, aesthetics, for wood volume, what, whatever it is, these, these functions, right? And so uh, we recently were just sort of wrapping up this literature review, uh, looking at what is the, the ecological role, the functional role of spatial pattern uh, in infrequent fire dry, dry forests. We probably should have done this at the beginning of this whole project when we started dealing with, with pattern, but at the time, we really didn't, there wasn't a lot of literature. Now there's been a lot that's emerged in the recent years, um, so we're putting this together and hopefully it'll be out relatively soon. Um, and so again, we, in this review, we looked at fire behavior, we looked at habitat, um, we looked at uh, pathogens, we looked at snow retention, um, insects, um, a, a variety of different functions, uh, and we really, wanted to get this idea of, you know, when you do a more diverse or more, more variable treatment, a high structural vari diversity treatment versus a more uniform treatment, what are the functional differences? What is the effect on fire behavior, habitat, uh, et cetera? Um, this is uh, from Black's Mountain Experimental Forest that, uh, in California, Northern California, and they, they started this a while ago, one of the things we reviewed. So this was from that same study looking at fire behavior, and uh, what they found, and this has been really consistent across both field studies and a whole uh, a number of modeling studies that have come out recently that have used really sophisticated, spatially explicit fire models, have found that by and large, when you compare a, a more variable treatment with a more uniform treatment, you get kind of the same fire effects in terms of overall mortality. Both of them reduce uh, fire, uh, crown fire and mortality significantly, right? So here's the uh, the, the untreated right here, here's the treated, this is the high diversity. You can see that the white is de died, the, the black survived. Most trees, particularly after you got into the treatment, survived. Same over here in this low structural diversity, most survived. Interestingly, the low structural diversity without prescribed fire, this was a wildfire that moved here, through here, the cone fire. So. Uh, when they didn't do the prescribed fire, those, those surface fuel treatments, you had a lot more mortality. Um, and so the message here is that these, these large-scale factors, your density and your structure are really driving fire behavior, um, and the variability doesn't seem to have a huge effect. Um, however, we, you do see that, that when you have more variable uh, patterns, you do get more variable uh, fire behavior, particularly surface fire behavior, and, and a little bit of mortality as well. So turning to snow retention, uh, kind of the 
the, the short answer here is that uh, more, ver more variable patterns do get you a little bit more snow retention. The snow, there's more snow and it lasts a little bit longer uh, into the spring. And, and this varies in, in really dry, uh, lower elevation areas, you don't see this as much. At mid elevation areas, you seem to see it more. And at high elevations, I'm not, we're not, not as clear. But, um, um, and the, the reason that we see this is that um, when you have kind of a dense canopy, you have a lot of interception, uh, and so the snow never gets to the ground and then evaporates off. Uh, when you have these small gaps, um, you, have an, you, you don't have the interception from the trees, so the snow can accumulate, but those gaps are also shaded. So, so the, that, that benefits when you, have, when you start to get larger openings, then you get more solar radiation uh, as well as more... Um, uh, um, radiation off the trees here. So it's those small to medium sized gaps where you get the most snow. So variable treatments that have more of those gaps, you, you get more snow retention. Um, the literature is also pretty clear uh, that, that this fine scale pattern really d matters for stand development. Again, if you're trying to create these multi-age fine scale forests, um, the, the way these work is you have uh, regeneration coming in typically in gaps in these dense thickets and, and openings. Um, those get thinned out over time by fire and insects and whatnot. They develop into old trees. Um, and then mortality, bark beetles, fire takes these large old clumps out. You get an opening again and that cycle uh, continues. And that's going on at, at little patches kind of throughout a stand. This is a bit of a simplified cartoon here, but that kind of gives you the, the idea. So to summarize, why does pattern matter? Um, uh, first of all, again, it, it's that density structure and pattern, those overarching things, sorry, the density structure and composition are kind of first order drivers of disturbance behavior, whether it's insects, fire, um, pathogens, uh, pattern seems to have a secondary effect, but when you have more variable patterns, you get more variable di disturbance behavior and that is a self-reinforcing mechanism. When we look at snow retention, also understory diversity and abundance, non-tree vegetation, we look at habitat for a range of species, we do see a clear increase in function from more variable patterns. Uh, both goshawks, uh, white-headed woodpeckers uh, really benefit from, from more variable stand patterns for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then when we look at sort of that long-term forest development, um, we see again this cycle when you, if you restore more variable patterns, um, that's gonna lead to more variable disturbance behavior, um, which then is gonna reinforce this multi-age fine scale structure. And, and the idea is to move these dense simplified stands, again, legacy of past management. In this case, you don't have old trees. It's a plantation that also has dense understory. And if you wanna move it towards this, uh, we think it does make sense to try to restore variable patterns in, from a functional standpoint. Again, I want to stress that pattern isn't everything, right? It's only a piece of how these systems work, right? We're managing for these big picture resilience and ecosystem functions. We have our vegetation, composition really matters, structure of course matters, disturbances, how they behave really can dry, override often the, these factors. And then of course the biophysical environment has a huge, in, a huge influence as well. Um, uh, really that, that create what, what's possible. And so pattern is only one, one piece of this. I don't, don't wanna overstate the role of pattern, but we think it is important. So now I'm gonna jump into uh, um, uh, these reference conditions, this real challenge, management challenge of, okay, we know pattern's important in our treatments, um, how do we quantify uh, targets in such a way that, that, that we can uh, implement them in a practical and, and efficient manner, right? And so we developed this uh, tool called ICO, Individual uh, uh, Clumps and Openings. Um, and it's two things. It's a method of quantifying reference conditions. And then number two, a way of translating those into, uh, into uh, uh, targets for, for prescriptions. Um, so... Uh, the first part of this was to put in a whole lot of reference plots. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years now uh, throughout Oregon and Washington, and we have five kind of separate sites. Each site has anywhere from nine to 14 reference plots in them. Um, so a total of 55 plots, these are on average about four hectares, 10 acres. Uh, and in these sites, uh, we reconstruct uh, what the forest was like before fire suppression. So in 1890 or 1880, and, and there's a whole methodology to do this, which I won't get into. Um, 
Uh, again, we're looking at frequent fire forests, and we, we uh, in, each, in each area, looked at a range from fairly dry, kind of pure ponderosa-type sites, all the way to, to fairly messic sites with maybe a little bit of subalpine fir and uh, you know, lodgepole and whatnot. Again, more at that low end of mixed severity uh, type of range. Um, and so we go out and map those, uh, those sites uh, with a stem map, so we know the location of all the trees. And then we use this, this uh, clump algorithm where we basically we have a stem map and we say, okay, um, these are four trees here. Uh, if, you, if you have a two meter distance, um, uh, all these trees are individual trees, right? If you go to a larger distance here, down to three, this is supposed to be one meter, I don't know what happened. So if you go to a two meter distance, now these are uh, a three tree clump, they're connected. If you go to a three meter distance between the trees, now all the trees form, uh, form one clump. Uh, so this is a, a fairly simple way of quantifying this idea of when trees are in clumps or individual trees or openings. Um, and again, these forests, when you get out on the ground, you really see uh, th this idea, it just emerges. That you see these clear individual trees with large crowns, these small clumps, these medium tree clumps, and these large and we call super clumps. Um, and of course, there's the openings uh, as well. So, um, so again, what we do is we take these stem maps, these historical stands, we put them through that clump algorithm, and we really focus on this, this six meter distance, about 20 feet between trees, um, and that allows us to quantify the percent of trees in different size clumps. And it sounds a little complicated at first, but it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, it's just okay, I have, in this plot here, I have 21% of the trees are individuals, meaning they have no neighbors within 20 feet. 11% uh, of the trees are in these large clumps, 60 to 30 trees uh, uh, in here, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, what are the, some, some just basic results from, from these 55 reference plots uh, across Oregon and Washington? Um, looking at just density, trees per acre, and canopy cover, again, you can see pretty good convergence among these sites. And so, in looking at all these different, you know, very, we started up in the Colville National Forest, uh, we have the Eastern Cascades of Washington, down on, in, in South Central Oregon on the Fremont Wainema, the Malheur on the, the uh, um, Blues Mount, Blue Mountains in Northeast Oregon, and we actually have a site down in Southwest Oregon from the, the Klamath, uh, uh, Rogue Siskiyou area. So a really wide geographic range of, of frequent fire forests, right? And you see pretty common density and pretty common canopy cover as well, really showing you that, that commonality of frequent fire forests. And so this is what, what the pattern looks like uh, with, with the density. So down here we have the density of the forest, trees per hectare, and up here we have this mean clump size, which is kind of the the overall, how clumpy is it? This is really low, a more uniform pattern, lots of individual trees. Up here we have lots of, you know, more trees in clumps. So this is from the Malheur National Forest. Um, this is the idea of an envelope of pattern. This is from the Colville. This is from the Rogue Siskiyou, the Okanagan Wenatchee. Um, and the last one from the Fremont Wainema. And so you see there's just a lot of overlap uh, between these different sites. Um, and so we feel pretty confident, you know, we haven't quantified everything that was out on the historic, uh, uh, the landscape historically by any means, uh, but we feel like we have a pretty good idea of, of the pattern that exists in, in most of these frequent fire forests. Um, we looked at openings, again, we found a pretty common pattern of a lot of small openings, less than about, it's about a tenth of an acre, and then, you know, some larger openings, but, but not, not that many large openings. And again, none of these were statistically different among sites. So again, some stands have a lot of little openings, and then some of them, the lower density stands, tend to have more openings, you can, you can see here. Another piece of this we looked at is, again, this, this two levels of variability, this spatial aggregation, and, and we found that about half the plots um, show statistically uh, spatial aggregation when one part of the plot uh, is much more open, lower density than the other part of the plot. The other half of the plots didn't show, you know, they tended to be more of this, the same type of fine scale variability everywhere. 
Um, so this allowed us to really sort of express, okay, in, in our reference envelope, we have these low density plots out here tend to be, have, have lower, uh, lower clumping, these mid-density mid plots with a mid-range of clumping, and these higher density reference plots uh, with more clumps. Still, when I say high density, that's still much lower than a lot of our stands today, right? So um, the last part of this is what's working, what's not in terms of uh, restoration treatments. Um, and uh, this kind of started with, with a challenge um, of, you know, a lot of silviculturalists have, throughout the West have, you know, gotten this idea that they want to restore this variability and would describe it to marking guidelines or in prescriptions in, in, in a subjective way. Uh, and the marking crews would go out and they'd think they'd done it. And, and the silviculturists would go out and they'd say, well, you're not getting it. And they'd argue about it. And so... This whole ICO idea came about as a way, can we quantify this in a simple way that the marking crews and people, they know when they're getting the variability right. You know, maybe it's too uniform, maybe it's too clumpy. And again, it's not meant to be a straitjacket. We have a range uh, of, of, of pattern that we're going for, but are you, are you in the range, the target range, right? And so uh, as part of my dissertation, kind of we started out with this idea of, Okay, we're going to take uh, an untreated stand right here. We went out and stem mapped it. We put in some reference plots in the area, some small ones to kind of get an idea for a target. And then we, we sort of developed a very early version of ICO and, and we did a treatment. And then the treatment worked out okay. It got us kind of within the reference conditions at the lower end of, of pattern of clumpiness. But then I said, okay, on the computer in a simulation environment, because we had these stem maps, I could do some different treatments, uh, you know, a treatment where we really tried to mix things up and get some big openings and more clumps, and then compare that with a more traditional basal area uh, approach, uh, where you have a target basal area of, say, 60 or 80 square feet of basal area, um, and a spacing base, where you're saying, okay, I'm, you know, every 30 foot spacing or 25 foot spacing or, or whatever it is. And the results from that were pretty clear, um, that the uh, spacing based in particular, uh, as well as the basal area, we tended to fall outside of that reference envelope that, that, we, just, that, that, uh, that we'd established from that study, and we've, we've certainly established much more robustly uh, now. Uh, and so that means that, again, in these, rest, in these more uniform treatments, we're getting the density right. Uh, but we're, we're over, compared to reference conditions, uh, we have too many individual trees, we're lacking uh, those larger clumps, and we're lacking the openings as well. And again, that has, that has ramifications for snow retention, for habitat, those things that I talked about earlier, right? Um, our treatments, uh, some of uh, um, uh, the treatment where we had explicit pattern targets uh, got us within, within the envelope. Of course, our current conditions are way out here, right? Way too many trees per acre, and, and because of that, the whole forest tends to be one clump. Um, and so from that, we developed this, the, the, the silvicultural tool part of ICO. Um, and it's, it's pretty simple, I'm not going to go into it, where you, you take a, a fairly standard dry forest restoration treatment uh, that we talked about earlier, um, you have a density target, and you, you translate that into trees per acre, um, but you can use standard stocking guidelines or whatever you want, um, and then you just add a target uh, for your, these different clump sizes, for individual trees, small clumps, medium clumps, uh, and large clumps, um, and, and th that those targets are based on reference conditions, and you have to kind of tailor those to the site uh, in a way. Um, and so when the marking crew goes out, uh, they have a target of, of this many that they're trying to get. And we quickly realized that we really needed to track as we went. Um, we started out with paper. Now we've actually developed an Android app, um, which actually works really well. It almost works too well because the crew goes through the forest and, and, and they're, they're one, one crew member is recording what, what different people of the crew are leaving. So if someone leads an individual, they say, well, individual, or maybe five individuals if they've left a bunch. Someone else says a 10 tree clump and so on and so forth. And this person is recording that and, and it works pretty fast. Uh, and so you get this immediate feedback of, are we getting the pattern right? Are we getting this ratio right? It also tells you, are we getting the overall density right? Are we leaving too many trees or, or not enough? And so we found that, you know, when you have too many individuals, it'll start, this, this box starts going red. And so the market, so people, when we had paper, everyone just ignored it for the most part. Um, 
But with these apps, with the red color, and I've been out myself, you're like, oh, it's, it just kind of agitates people. And so the crew comes back, and they, they want no red, you know, they want everything to be right. And we're like, well, did you pay attention to the stand? Uh, did, you, did you pay attention to tree health and vigor and those other parts of the prescription? And they're like, oh, we think so, but we got the pattern right. And so we've, you know, had to be a little careful with that because, uh, you know, the goal here isn't to get, it's not just about pattern, right? It's the density, the structure, you know, those are those first order things. We got to get those right first in our tree health and our tree vigor. And then the pattern, uh, I think, comes secondarily. But what's been really interesting about this is that, um, this approach is that you can really move away from trying to hit the same spacing or basal area target on every acre. Because you have a target for the whole stand, you can really work with the stand. And more open areas or if there's root disease or whatnot, you know, you thin much more heavily and maybe you just leave individuals. And you hit an area that, a little draw that's got some great clumps where you can leave that more dense. And so you get more of that that, that's, that level two variability, right? Where you, uh, and again, that's really tailored to the topography and soils and, and so forth. Um, so um, I'm gonna end with, we've gone out and then monitored a, a lot of different sites um, in Oregon and Washington. And we kind of have a monitoring approach to, to doing this where we quick map stands. And we've looked at treatments, ICO, uh, and there's a lot of other approaches I want to say that have explicit pattern targets. Um, ICO isn't the only approach. There's a lot of other tools and it's, you know, I'm not saying it's the best. A lot of, you know, I just say do what works for you. Uh, and then we compared those with more traditional and spacing targets uh, and then some combination approaches as well. What we found again when we've looked at 38 different sites across Oregon and Washington, these are treated stands. Uh, well, first of all, all approaches achieve those basic density and composition goals. That, that's pretty standard. That, that's fairly obvious. That's at least reassuring. But again, those, those uh, more uniform or spacing, more uniform treatments tend to get us outside the envelope um, our, our, of our reference conditions. You know, when you look at a Google Earth image, you're like, wow, it's pretty uniform. You don't see that fine scale pattern. Uh, a lot of people say, well, what if we add skips to that? That's, you know, we'll do our thing and then we'll add skips, these unthinned patches of maybe an acre or five acres. And, and we found those are outside of the reference envelopes too. Now your clumping is too high. And what's interesting is you see here, you know, this is all pretty uniform and then they left these big skips here. And it's like, that's not, again, that might be good or bad, but it's not what we find in, in our reference uh, conditions. Uh, but when we do use uh, prescriptions with explicit, explicit pattern targets, ICO, or there's other approaches that work as well, uh, we, we really can get, get in that envelope. And here's just some photos for a treat, treatment, a recent treatment on the Fremont Wainema National Forest. You know, really this sharp contrast, some large clumps over here, uh, you know, this opening with a lot of regeneration, some individual trees, again, uh, kind of back here. Um, so it's, some of these treatments, they are a real contour, very different than a, than a traditional kind of basal area approach where, where there's trees everywhere. And when I want to just say that it's one of the biggest, ch there's a kind of aerial view of it, of a, this is a different treatment, but again, you see, see really that, uh, the, the clumpy gappiness, but also some real openings in that, that little, I want to say openings have one, been one of the most challenging things to get. Uh, people just have a hard time not leaving trees out there. We're really trained to do that. But openings are so critical to all those functions I talk about. Uh, you know, they're as important as, as the trees. So, um, so something to really think about. We've also looked at some prescribed fire treatments. Those tend to create openings and accentuate the openings, particularly if they can burn hot enough. So used together, the silviculture or the commercial thinning with, with prescribed fire works really well. So... Um, I'll just end by saying again that, that uh, we can, we have quantified reference conditions as happen in other parts of the West. Um, we can, uh, you know, we, we see this, this clear pattern of, of, of clumps and gaps and openings at a fine scale. Um, uh, we don't see these really large dense patches in our historical uh, uh, forest. And so this idea of leaving lots of skips out there, again, you may want to do it for, for habitat or whatever, but don't do it because you think you're restoring historical conditions. Um, and that restoring these fine scale patterns really, really matters for a lot of the functions that uh, we're managing for. So thank you. Um, definitely some private landowners that, you know, th their main objectives aren't, aren't economic, um, certainly have, uh, 
You know, a lot of people in, in our pine and dug fir kind of fire forests, uh, you know, been trying different variants of uneven age management for, for a long time. Um, and I think this is uh, just a little bit of a new twist on that. It builds on a lot of that knowledge and, and whatnot and, and, and kind of gives you some, some targets for, for, for pattern to, to kind of augment those approaches. So people that have already kind of want to manage for, for uh, mul you know, multi-ages and age classes have, have said, oh yeah, this, this is a useful tool or at least can tell me Am, am I in the wheelhouse of, of these, these, historic, these forests that had an, and persisted with, uh, with an active fire regime for, for a long time? So we've also had a lot of land trusts and, and those kinds of, you know, semi-private owners uh, have definitely been taking this up. Yeah, it's definitely different scales, uh, uh, first of all, and, and also the refuser in the context of typically a high severity fire uh, that burns across, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 acres over, over a large area um, where the fire skips. This is really when you have a, um, a low severity fire regime uh, that's you know, burning through an intact forest and it's, it's going to kill, you know, some individual trees, take out some clumps here and there, uh, but what we found is it... Um, uh, we're not saying that uh, there may have been some areas and draws or places where fires did skip and, and, and some really dense patches were able to, to persist for a while, uh, but we haven't really found those in, in, our, in our reference plots that, that, that we're doing uh, out there. So, so it's both a scale and then a fire severity issue as well, if that makes sense. So this is also historically the fire refugia uh, is, is she was talking about is, is today and in, in the context of today's high severity fires. So. Kind of related, when you're um, using the reference plots as guidelines for conditions, how have you dealt with a changing consensus on what the reference material is used as? Oh. That's, you know, generally we've had high fire history studies. Uh, in the area, so we kind of know when fire turned off and when you start to su see that increases in density. Um, uh, so yeah, that hasn't been a, a bigger challenge I thought you were going is that the reference envelope is actually pretty wide and that's great. So it gives managers and, and stakeholders a lot of flexibility, but within that you can actually, some of those reference plots are fairly uniform. Uh, they're not that different or sometimes they're the same as our basal area treatments. Um, and so, you know, when, and that's part of this literature review is like, well, what are the trade-offs? If I manage for uh, a more uniform pattern still within historical stands or within those reference uh, envelope, what functions do I get there? And then if I have, leave a more complex pattern with more openings and more clumps, what, what functions what, uh, am I getting, getting there? And, and I also really want to stress that again, you, at, at the end of the day, you've got to scale this up to a landscape and put all those stands together and think about how that pattern works uh, across a project area or watershed and so forth. 